Act 3. Back in Metropolis, the large alien craft sets down in the middle of the city, causing chaos and confusion. A door opens on the ship and a being steps out. He is 12 feet tall, wearing a tight suit of something that could be metal or leather. His features are enlarged, like his bones are too large and extra dense. But there's a cold gleam of true intelligence in his eyes. This is no savage beast. This is a conqueror. This is Mongol. Mongol wanders down the main drag of Metropolis's downtown core. Traffic has already bent around his ship's landing, and now emergency vehicles are showing up, along with a couple of TV reporters. A pod, identical to the one that communicated with Luthor, is floating over Mongol's shoulder, following him along. A police officer, his weapon drawn, approaches Mongol. Mongol strides up to the man. When Mongol speaks, the pod translates. Are you the Kryptonian? Before the police officer can respond, Mongol reaches down and crushes the man's head. As he dies, the cop squeezes off several shots which ricochet off of Mongol, causing the giant alien no harm. Mongol laughs as the dying man shudders and goes limp. Back at the Daily Planet, Jimmy and Lois are watching the footage of Mongol's progression through downtown. Police officers are opening fire on Mongol, who wades through the crowd happily, killing anybody who falls in range of his giant hands. <sighs> Lois shudders. What do you think he is? I don't know, Jimmy says, but whatever he is, you know Clark's gonna fight him. You think this might be something he can't handle? I don't know how to tell. I don't think any of us know how powerful he really is. Back downtown, Clark lands a few paces away from Mongol and shouts advice to the emergency crews. Just get everybody away from here. I'll deal with this. Mongol walks up to Clark. Mongol curls a fist and strikes Clark with a blow powerful enough to level a skyscraper. Clark rolls with it, staggers a bit, but doesn't go down. Sir, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to calm down. Mongol speaks and the sphere translates. Kryptonian. But more than Kryptonian. Here, the radiation affects you. The yellow sun makes you more. More than Kryptonian. Am I supposed to just talk to the ball or you or, or what? The pod scans Clark and makes little sounds at Mongol, who quickly glances over at what the pod has discovered, and Mongol laughs. You have many strengths. That is good. I see radiation makes you strong, but weak, too. <laughs> Irony, it is your own radiation that makes you weak. Your home. My home doesn't make me weak. It makes me strong. Not this home. Your real home. I have some with me. I took it as a souvenir when I visited the meteor belt that used to be Krypton. What do you mean? Another pod approaches from Mongol's ship, and once in front of Clark, it opens, dropping a large chunk of rock about the size of a bowling ball at Clark's feet. The rock glows bright green. And in that green glow, Clark grows weak. He can feel it. He can feel his power slipping away and a heavy sickness coming over him. Well, what is that? It is your homeworld, Kryptonian. And it is your death. And then Mongol starts beating on Clark. A TV news crew off to the side are filming the action, unable to look away. Back at the Daily Planet, Lois and Jimmy are watching Superman on the TV. Oh my god, that thing is gonna kill him. We have to... we have to do something. What? What, what are we gonna do? We can't just let him go out there and get beaten to death. We're his friends. It's that rock. Whatever it is, that's what's doing it. Look, he said it was radiation, right? What if we got a big lead box for it? Would that work? Where are we gonna get a big lead box? Like a... like a safe or something. Meanwhile, Mongol is beating on Clark. Both aliens bathed in the green glow. Mongol is having a wonderful time, and Clark is offering no resistance to the brutality. In Perry's office, Jimmy uses a fire axe to chop Perry's personal safe out of the wall. 
Lois asks, I is it lead? Perry shrugs. Well, it's lead-lined. Close enough, come on. The safe tumbles down to the ground. Jimmy and Lois do their best to carry it. Great Caesar's ghost. Lombard, get in here and help these two. A giant mountain of a sports reporter bounds into the room and assists Jimmy and Lois in getting the safe into the elevator and then into Jimmy's car. As Jimmy and Lois drive across the city, Mongol is beating on Clark. He is savagely striking him again and again. Whatever residual superhuman strength remains in Clark is all that's keeping him alive, but there's no fight in him. He just hangs limply from Mongol's hand. Clark is barely conscious. He's bleeding from his nose and ears, and it doesn't stop. Mongol is laughing, throwing Clark around and beating him into the pavement. While Mongol's attention is on Clark, rescue teams are evacuating the blocks around the fight. Mongol notices this and drops Clark to the ground, wanders over to where some firefighters are struggling to free a school bus that's gotten stuck in the broken pavement. Mongol approaches the school bus and licks his lips hungrily. The children scream and the firefighters continue their struggle, now only moments away from the death at the hands of this giant monster. Somehow, beaten to hell, a step away from death, Clark pulls himself to his feet. Hey, we ain't done here. Mungle turns away from the school children and walks back to continue beating on Clark. The firefighters manage to push the bus forward and everybody escapes as Mungle's Fists pound Clark into the ground. Jimmy pulls up close to where the fight's going on and drives through the wreckage, pulling up to where the large chunk of kryptonite is glowing on the ground. Together, Jimmy and Lois struggle to lift the rock, which appears to be harmless to humans. They get it up and into the safe in the back of Jimmy's car, and then Lois slams the lid of the safe, and the green glow disappears. Twenty feet away, Clark momentarily comes to his senses and smashes Mongol away. Clark rushes over to the safe, grabs it, the metal of the safe burning his hands, and then he throws it up into the sky and into space. We follow the safe for a moment. It goes a couple of miles into space, too far to ever fall back to Earth. Back down in Metropolis, Clark has fully regained his senses. He smiles warmly at Lois. Thank you, Lois. Hey, Jimmy says. I... I helped too. I know you did, pal, but thank you, Lois. Mongol smashes Clark and grabs Lois, one great hand wrapped around her throat and torso. This one matters to you. I shall take her from you and see how that makes you. Clark's heat vision burns through Mongol's wrist. Two holes the size of nickels straight through his arm. Mongol screams and drops Lois. Clark rushes up, grabs Lois, and then whisks her and Jimmy away as Mongol winces and holds his burned arm. We see Clark setting Jimmy and Lois down on the outskirts of the city, and then he comes back to Mongol. You ready to end this now? You think you will end this? I am the most powerful being you've ever faced, Kryptonian. Greater species than you have broken their hands against my hide. That's good to hear because... Can I tell you something? All my life, I've been holding back. And I've always wondered what would happen if I didn't. Clark grimaces, flexes, and flies straight at Mongol. Flying around Mongol at supersonic speed, Clark dizzies the beast and smashes him with a hundred punches in just a few seconds, moving faster and faster, hitting harder and harder. Mongol falls to his knees. Mercy! Mercy, Kryptonian! Mercy? Kryptonians have no word for mercy. Clark's eyes are full of cosmic fire. He could burn a hole straight through Mongol, execute him here on the street. Lucky for you, I'm not from Krypton. I'm from Kansas. Mongol cowers. Now get back into your ship and get the hell off my planet. A day later, Lois and Clark are walking through the park at night. Still, I'd have to admit that was... That was pretty impressive, Kent. Oh yeah? Which part? The part where you looked human. I've always wondered if you were brave, if your actions didn't cost you anything. Like I've seen you get knocked around a little before, but today, he would have killed you. And you would have taken it. To give any of us a chance to get away, 
to save even a single life. You took a beating for the world. I wasn't really thinking about the whole world. No? What were you thinking about? Clark takes Lois's hand. She's startled, but she figures it out after a moment, and then she leans in and kisses him. Back in Luthor's office, Luthor is talking to a computer screen, his bodyguard chilling out behind him. This is Corbin, the screen says. Please come in. This is Luthor. What's your status, Corbin? Your math was good, sir. I'm in visual range of the box now. How much did this cost us to get our man up there first? Twenty billion dollars, sir. Jesus. Better cut back on overtime for a while. So what's in the box that makes it so worthwhile? The past. The future. The death of Superman. Huh. Back downtown Metropolis, Clark is walking down the street. Happy. And then he hears something he doesn't like. And why don't you go back to where you came from? Clark turns and sees a trio of neo-Nazi skinhead thugs hassling an Indian family. A man, his wife, and their two kids, a little girl and a boy. So Clark goes over and starts shit. Two guys go down just trying to hurt Clark. The last one pulls out a gun and shoots Clark multiple times. Clark catches the bullets and drops them on the ground. And then Clark picks the man up and they float up into the sky. A mile up, the neo-Nazi is shivering and terrified. I'm sure to you, it seems like you're fighting for something important. Your people, your tribe, your skin. Whatever it is that you need to believe that makes you different from other people. But from up here, I find, you can see, there are no other people. There's just people. All of us. We're all in it together. There's just a little bit of Earth. Clark turns and lifts the neo-Nazi so they're looking out into space. And there's so much darkness out there. That's why it's so vital that we all work together. Do you understand what I'm saying? The man nods. Yes? Yes! Clark lands on the street with the neo-Nazi who collapses to the ground crying and quivering. Clark steps back and the husband of the Indian family steps forward and offers a hand to help the neo-Nazi up. The neo-Nazi looks at the family, his face a mess of tears and snot. He sees something in the family. He is a moment of a realization. And then he stumbles back and away, running off into the night. Clark sighs. He wonders if he can really help. He turns and waves meekly at the Indian family. Still hiding behind his mother, the little boy leans out and waves at Superman. Clark smiles, and the boy smiles back at him. Slowly, Clark floats up into the sky. Higher and higher he goes, eventually moving from the darkness of the American night to the new day, all the way on the other side of the world. It's a voyage from the darkness to the light, and we spend it traveling with Clark as he soars over land masses and oceans, heading from night into day. We see the curvature of the earth, the darkness of space, and the sunlight beyond it. Our last shot is of Clark in a classic John Byrne flight pose, grinning up into the sunshine as he flies through space. He throws a wink, and then we fade up into the stars, and then into black, and then into credits.